Good morning, Sarah Beach Pop Church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Ready for the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the beautiful world. Second Corinthians three sixteen says, "All of Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for proof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness." I want to talk about what is probably the most famous sentence in the entire Bible. Now, I want to, uh, the whole word of God, this is probably the most famous sentence. And according to how often we see it in society, you know, in football games, on side notes, even as graffiti on subway walls and those kinds of things, without a doubt, the most believable scripture that's out there. This particular scripture was spoken by Jesus in his discourse with Nicodemus, uh, and it is. If we really, when we take a look at it, it's the distillation of the entire gospel message, the entire Bible down into one sentence. One sentence. And what I'm talking about, obviously, 25 words, what I'm talking about, obviously, is John 3 16. If this is all we have, this would be sufficient for salvation. If it is all we have, it would be sufficient for salvation. And whether anybody would admit it or not, all, everybody from the worst atheist on the planet to the most highest theist, these are words that we need to hear and want to hear. Every human being wants to be able to hear God loves. Let's go and read it together. And everybody can probably quote it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The foundational part of this verse is that God loves you. He loves you. It doesn't make any difference who you are this morning, where you came from, what your, you know, what your stance is on Christianity, whether or not you are saved, God loves you. Every single so I find it perplexing. I hardly get my head around the fact that unsaved and unchurched people cling to this thing the way they do. You will hear people say, you know, I don't go to church, but God loves me. But they don't understand the eternal implications of what that means. They don't understand what takes place. Yes, God loves you. If you are not saved, God loves you. Enough that he made a way for you to be saved. Because there will be justice. Right? I'm also probably doubly perplexed by uh, many God fearing Christians that are often unsure of it. They don't feel it. They're not right here. don't feel it. That's the So I'd like to propose something to you guys this morning that I think might help us to understand why this can happen. Okay? Because it can. And it does. I want to propose something that will help us understand why it might happen, and also so that we can erase any doubt in everybody's mind this morning, your mind, and anybody that you run into that is unsure about God's love. I think we can cover how to erase all of that this morning so that no one walks out of here today without a feeling in their spirit God loves me. God loves me. Okay? That's what we're going to do. So, before we start, though, I want to talk a little bit about uh, another verse that's written by the same author, John. A few years after he wrote John 3.16, right? Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, we have two, two verses here. This may seem like a little bit of a contradiction. Uh, because God loves the world, commands us not to. So I want to explain that a little bit before I go into why all of this is really matters. We have to understand what's meant in the original context in the Greek. It's the same word. God so love the world. Do not love the world. It's the same word. It's, it's, it's the Greek word hostile. Okay? It means different things used in different contexts. And that's what we have to be able to understand. Let's look at this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19, we see this same word spoken. 
That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins against them. It has entrusted to us the message of reconciliation. Now it is pretty obvious from that verse that the context for world right there is people. Right? Do you agree with that this morning? That's not to sin their sins against them. Yes, it's the people. But then we take a look at John chapter 17, verse 14. And this is what Jesus says. I have given them your word, prayer to the Father, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, but they are not of the world. Just as I am not of the world. Okay? So we have three instances here of world, your worldviews. And this verse all by itself clears up any doubt or discrepancy that we might have. It allows us to know exactly what God is talking about when he says he loves the world and tells us not to. Right? So um, those three instances, the first word is the same word, it's cosmo. Okay? And this first use, cosmo, is people that are aligned with the world. People that are aligned with the world, the world system. But the second two are a slight variation in spelling. Cosmo. Okay, it's not the exact same thing. But it gives us a different meaning and it gives us the context of understanding the world and the world's world. Those two things mean the world from a moral aspect. Okay, the morality of the world. So we see when it says, if anyone loves the world, that's the morality of the world. The moral aspect of the world. Satan's world system. So to speak. The people that are in the world are not going to, you know, we, we don't love the things of the world, the morality of the world, but we love the people of the world. All the same wording, all the same thing, a whole bunch of scriptures, but we need to be able to understand that before we can take a step forward to try to understand what God is saying to us in other things. So, so this it is obvious that Jesus loved the world. Right? Because he died. People. But he is not a part of the world. He doesn't want us to be a part of the world. The satanic world system. A morality that we saw in some of those pictures when we started out this morning. That's the world's satanic system. That's the morality of the world that we are supposed to be a part of. Alright. Anyone who does not love does not know God. God is love. Okay, so God is love. When he says he loves you, it's because it's his character. It's a part of who he is. He is love. So why is it so hard sometimes? Let me feel it. Let me understand. All right. Have any of you ever heard of the book by Dr. Gary Chapman, The Five Love Languages? All right. Thank you. Um, if you're in any kind of relationship, any kind of relationship, this is essential right here. Uh, the premise of the book is that each human gives and receives love in one of five specific ways. Okay? Not all the same. Five specific ways. And those five love languages are acts of service, gifts of giving, spending quality time, words of affirmation, and physical touch. Each person in here this morning gives and receives love in one of those specific ways. You need to think about it. If you don't know what yours is, you need to think about it. Try to figure it out. And then if you don't know what your significant other's is, you need to think about it and try to figure it out. And, and, and we'll talk about what I used to say. I mean, each of us prefers to receive love and feel love in one of those specific ways. The problems begin when one or more persons in the relationship tries to show the other that they love them using their own language when the person in the relationship speaks a different language. I'm gonna give you a for instance here. Um, my love language is acts of service. I do stuff. That's what I do. That's who I am. That's what it is, unfortunately for me. My wife's language is quality time. Okay? Those two things are diametrically opposed to each other. So I'm out in the yard just tearing up, man, raking leaves, sweeping, all by myself, just going, you know, my wife is going to love me for all of these things that I'm doing while she's sitting alone, 
on the porch with the dog, thinking that I have two heads and neither one of them is functioning. <laughs> Did you guys see the problem here? Have you seen how that works? Or why that could be a problem? Sure. Listen, God is the author of all languages. Those that are spoken and the one languages that he has created. He speaks all of those languages, both verbal and love languages, because he created all Now, John 3.16 resonates with me, right? I feel it. I've heard it thousands of times, and there are times that it still makes me cough. Because that's my language. I see the sacrifice and the service that were laid down, not just by the Father, giving him his one and only Son, but also by the Son, who willingly laid down his life. Really, that act of service, it resonates with me amazingly. But, if this verse, if John 3, 16, doesn't speak to you, that's okay, because it might not be in your language. It might not be the language that you speak. If your language is physical touch, that might not mean as much to you as if as, as it does to me. Because I'm an access service. Okay? So when we feel as if God's love is distant, perhaps, perhaps we've just not spent enough time in God's word to find the places <laughs> that He's speaking in our language. Maybe we just skimmed the surface and never touched on how God speaks to us individually according to our love language. You can't really know, you cannot know that God loves you until you know how God loves you. Okay? And, and, it, and it comes through the language of love. That's how we understand it. That is, that's exactly how it works. So first off, I'm going to delve into and continue a little deeper in the Acts of Service. It says, Rarely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man some would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's an act of sacrifice. That is an act of service for us. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. That is an act of service, that is an act of sacrifice. And if, you, if you're loved by him this morning, it's acts of service. If you're just like a doer, you're just always busy doing stuff. You know, thinking, oh yeah, this is going to what the hell to do this? I'm going to get everything ready to make coffee in the morning. That's your, that's your love language, or that's what you're speaking to your wife. I'm going to say another one. She doesn't care about that. She wants you to drink coffee with her. I know this by practical experience. That's exactly what it works. So listen, these, these, these verses, they speak to me. When they touch my heart, they are exactly what I need to hear. Because that's my problem. If your love language is acts of service, if, if this is resonating with you this morning, you can look at the act of love that was written in these verses and you can feel like oh, the weight of it inside of you. Does anybody who speaks this language that speak and understand the sacrifice of a living God of giving his son and the son is the sacrifice, the act of service? Die on the cross. And that's the and that will be to you. Those of you who have that love language, that would be the ultimate thing. That's the ultimate, ultimate love. And God speaks it to us. Not just in these couple of verses that I laid out this morning, but throughout his word. And there are verses that will speak to your heart exactly as God will you. So what about you who speak gifts or giving? That's your love language. You just know, love giving and giving stuff. That's it. You know, that's, that's what it's all about. And by all of you receiving salvation, you know that sometimes the language may not resonate with you quite like you would hope it would. Okay? You know, by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. 
It is a gift for him, for the Lord. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. We got gifts, we will get gifts. All of you whose love language is giving, God's important, and you know, it's like nothing better than getting the, uh, you know, the, the thing of roses or the, uh, or the basket of donuts, you know, for Valentine's Day. That's your love language. These things should be speaking to you. These, these words that God put in His Word should be speaking to you. You speak this one. Yes, very, very important. You should hear what's being said. You should see what's being said right here. God's a gift giver. He's given us the most unbelievable gift ever the sacrifice of the Son. Jesus gave His life for you. He's the ultimate gift giver as well. Change right there. I'll do gift givers. Right? Just like my wife, okay, there are, there are plenty of people in attendance who speak the language of quality time. That's all you want to do. You just want to be, you desire to be with the people you love. And you desire for the people you love to be with you. Well, guess what? Today's your lucky day because God wants to be with you too. Absolutely. Go ahead. Draw near God, and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double minded. We make an attempt to draw near to God. What's He want? He's just waiting for you to want to do that. If you want quality time, prepare yourself, allow yourself. To spend the quality time that God already wants to spend with you. That's exactly what He wants. The fact that is, is that, uh, if we look at the second one, I am the vine with the branches. He who remains in me spends time, and I in him, Jesus spending time back, bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. And so we look at that and we see that Jesus is telling me, us that if we don't want to spend quality time with him, and we don't spend quality time with him, we can't do anything. Nothing else matters. But and, and if we're quality time people, that should be a warm fuzzy. Right now, nothing else matters. Only the quality time that you're looking for. You can't do anything unless you're spending quality time with Jesus. Just speak to your heart. And listen, any time you spend with Jesus is quality time. That should really excite us for all the times in the words. But what about words of affirmation? How many of you out there just love to hear? I trust those words. How many? How many out there are? That is what they want to hear. You know what you do? Man, that person, you did a great job on the one. You know, I mean that. That is it. Look at the way you trim that. That's perfect. There's not a single way to ask that place. It might work for both. But ask the service guys in, you know, the words of affirmation. So, how does this language work? You know, what God has to say in his word, right? As the Father loved me, I also love you. Remain in my love. Anybody not here, not like to hear I love you? I am so glad that we raised your hand. <laughs> We're going to have to spend some time in class. Yes, obviously, we all love to hear that, but the people who like affirmation that that's their love language, oh, man, it's not just the like. It's, I love to hear. I love to hear. Jesus tells us that. He gives us those words of that language. What? Let your lives be without love of money and be content with the things you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Wow, what kind of affirmation is that to know that if you are in Christ, if all of you in Christ this morning, he will never leave you or forsake you. But that's an affirmation for one time. That puts the mind at ease and the heart to Twitter. And not the one being on the bus. And so it's what gives us the fuzzies. It's affirming. God's word is full of of words of affirmation. 
chock full. You have probably one of the easiest love languages, and if that's your love language, of all of us who are trying to find God's love spoken to us in God's word, the Bible is full of that language. Now listen, I'm going to tell you, you know, you've got the folks that come up here, this is number five, and this one's a little bit more complicated than the rest. But, uh, if your love language is just a touch, if you just love nothing more than sitting next to someone you love, arms around each other, those titanic singing iceberg feet, you gotta be touching the other person in the middle of the night with your hands. <laughs> if that's you, it's okay. Don't worry. That's the kind of person you are, don't worry. God's got some words for you in His Word as well. Uh, first, I want you to understand that you have to exercise just a little bit of faith to be able to understand what God is saying to us in this particular instance. When it comes to this physical aspect of God, physical touch, for us, we have to exercise just a little bit of faith. When we go to a story uh, in the Bible, it's, it's a story about a Roman centurion who had a sick servant. And he came to find Jesus. He sought Jesus out and asked Jesus, to say, you know, to heal his servant. And Jesus said, okay, let's go. Let's go. Let's go do it. And then this centurion said something that amazed Jesus. Absolutely amazed Jesus. This is the So Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. And, and listen, we know by all of the other instances, except one other, in the entire Bible, at the times that Jesus was healing the people, what did he do? Touched him when they touched him with his robe. It was all about the touch, all about the healing touch. This was a little different. Jesus said to him, I'm going to heal him. And Centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant will be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this man, Go, and he goes, and to another, Come, and he comes, and to my servant, Do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he was amazed and said to those who followed, Truly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith. No, not in Israel. Now, this is a story about a centurion's great faith. That's what the story is about. There is something else contained in this story that I find even, even more appealing, that I find even more important for us to be able to it's a piece of information that comes to us from what Jesus did next. Okay? It says, Then Jesus said to the, church, to the centurion, Go your way, and as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that very moment. That very moment. And that's like I said, Jesus took many, many times to be an ability to touch someone in the let me explain to you. Jesus doesn't have to touch you to touch you. He does not have to touch you to do that. Many of you know the story about my wife and how three times over she had injuries in a car wreck that should have killed her. Doctors cannot explain why she's sitting here this morning. I can't explain why she's sitting here this morning. He healed her with a broken body. That's what happened. That's exactly what happened. And I know that there are other people in this room this morning that, including myself, who have gotten a healing touch from the Lord. Okay? A healing touch from the Lord. But if you're in front of just physical touch and you have never been restored, there's no, there's no, there's no worry. There is no issue with that. Because you can, in a tangible way, still feel and know that the word of God will speak to your heart through that language as well. Now, I guess. Then Saul also went home to India, and there went with him a band of valiant men whose hearts God had touched. Okay, what does that mean? What does that mean? God touched the hearts of these men to call them into service to the newly appointed king so that he would not be going back to his home by himself being the newly appointed king. 
valiant men, God touched their hearts and put them into service to protect the new king. He gave them something to do. And he touched their hearts and they didn't care. You're part of God's remnant this morning. That's why he touched your heart. He touched your heart when he brought you salvation. He touches your heart every time he speaks to you. He touches your heart every time he calls you to do something for him, some service. He touches your heart. God is working in your life whatsoever, any way, shape, or form. That's how he does that. Touches your heart. So you who have that language, you can know that God speaks to you in consistent ways. And by the way, he also tells us. Let's draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, letting our hearts sprinkled to cleanse them from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. But just as Jesus knelt down before his disciples on the basin of water and washed their feet, Physically wash their feet. We have the exact same thing. We can receive the touch of the washing of our spirits in the God touches us. God reaches out and touches us. So if that is your love language, if that is the way that you want to hear language, is physical touch, if that's the way that you want to give love, God also He's the inventor of that language, and he also speaks to you in his word. And God speaks to each one of us in a language that we can understand. You know? And I urge you, if you do not know what your language is, to learn what your language is. To understand what your language is. Learn it and then use it to feel closer to God every day. You're not feeling love. You can Google things like you know, God's gifts to man. If you're a gift person, Google that. You know, if, if you want to hear affirmation, you go Google God's affirmation to man. An amazing tool that we use to write. Okay? You will find a plethora of verses for every love language in this room this morning in God's word. It will speak to your heart. You can feel that love always. But God doesn't stand following that. He wants to give you words of affirmation. He wants to instruct you in the acts of service that He has already done and that He is going to do for you. He wants you to know that because of the touch of His there. He can speak all of those languages of God's healing. He speaks them and he receives them. So you know what? If you want to give them back to him in a way that's meaningful to you, you speak that language back to God. Yeah. You understand the way that you, you receive it and you give it back to God in the same way. He speaks all of those languages. I bet you make a first smile on his face to hear you. To have us all. I also encourage you this morning to learn if you don't know the love language of your significant other, a you know, really good idea to, uh, to figure it out. I mean, you'll see a grand difference in the person. And, and, and guys, let me just tell you. There's some guys, let me just tell you. This is not easy. Okay, it takes conscious thought. Because that's, you know, I mean, I've known this for a long, long time. I mean, it takes conscious thought for me to not be out sweeping the leaves and breaking up the yard. And, Picking stuff up and all the day. Wait a minute, Rob's on the porch. She wants to drink coffee with me. You know, I mean, there's a lot of leaves. Oh, yeah, you know, you've got to go sit on the porch. It takes conscious thought. Think about it. Use it. It will make a big difference in the relationship. It'll make a big difference in the relationship that you have with your significant other. It will make a huge relationship or a difference in the relationship that you have with God. If you understand, He speaks to you. Your language. He wants you to know that. Right? 
In this way, the love of God was revealed to us, that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Luke gives what way to put John 3, 16. God so loved us. Then we thought we thank you today, Lord. Oh, Lord, we thank you that you speak to us just the way we need to hear you, Father. And I thank you that you communicated this morning from your word and spoken to each person that's here. There's nobody in the room this morning that can't say that sermon from the Lord was for me. Because everybody, everybody in the word has spoken in language that's been communicated this morning. Let us take it, Father. Let us take it back and let's think about it, ponder it, and look for our language in your words so that you can speak to us even from Thank you so much that we do have this. Thank you for the gift of your son. We are so merciful that we praise God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.